First and foremost, Chris, thank you for making the time to join the show. I'm uh, like I was saying when we were catching up beforehand. I'm I'm pumped to have you on. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's always fun to sit and chat. You know? Yeah. Well, and you were just telling me too. You just you just wrapped up a day of school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're we're all e learning right now, so it's I have 75 minute periods, and most kids have their cameras off. You can't ask them to turn them on, so you uh. you have no idea what kind of response you're getting. And, and kids are trying to be polite and they keep their mics muted and stuff like that. So you could tell a joke, you have no idea if it's going over. You have no idea if kids are getting it. Um, you don't know if they're out screwing around playing video games and stuff like that so they can tell their parents their camera's on. So it, it's kind of like hosting a 75 minute radio show with no music, no <laughs> commercials, no call-ins. So this podcast hope, will be easy. Oh, <laughs> to talk to someone, it's incredible. In yeah. fact, this day and age, if someone texts me, I call them on the phone just so I can hear a different voice. Yeah, just to get a little interaction. Well, it's funny. My uh, my oldest daughter is in kindergarten. And so it's good in that, you know, the stakes aren't really high in terms of what she's expected to like learn in kindergarten. But also there's a part of me who like I'll walk by during the day and just having to watch her be on like what really is a conference call for, you know, three to four hours. I'm like, oh, yeah. What a tough way to learn. But then I think about these high school kids with a lot on the line. That's got to well, be brutal. My daughter goes to Iowa and she came home this weekend. She came home to get her oh. car. And so I walked by during my lunch period and there's she, or my lunch break, not my lunch period. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and she's in her room and she's watching a chemistry lecture. Oh. And I'm like, I'm paying for this. I'm paying a lot of money for this. A lot of money for this. <laughs> I can see in high school where, you know, your taxes pay for it and it's equal, but yeah, all right, it is what it is, you know, and, and I told my high school kids at the beginning of the school year, if you nail this, you'll be the most prepared students, maybe in the history of America, because the responsibilities that you have are way beyond anything we've asked any students in the past. Oh, yeah. So if you, if you can rock this and you can sit on a 75 minute call, you're going to rock, you're going to rock life. Oh yeah. The work, the corporate world will be uh, a breeze. Cause that's, yeah. I mean, I don't know what they're telling these kids, but that's basically all it comes down to. It's yeah. Like sh showing up to conference calls. <laughs> My <laughs> employer is listening. Like, was that what you're doing all day? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to have you on and Hey, maybe, maybe I can, I can start by asking you this. And I ask from a place of just like absolute respect. And I hope you take this uh, the right way, but for someone who's a high school track coach, how have you kind of become this like well-recognized speed guru? Huh. And I don't even know if you like that moniker. <laughs> you can tell me to take a hike, but. Uh, well, I kind of. So I've always been fascinated with speed. Yeah. I played football in college like you did. Um I was a, a wide receiver that was kind of always a step slow, but just got lucky. <laughs> and uh, I knew that. I knew, I think at a young age, I went to University of Illinois football camp and their ah, strength okay. coach said, hey, if if you want to play in the Big Ten, you got to run a 4-4 and squat 500 pounds. So as an eighth yeah. grader, that those became my markers. Uh, came to the point where this isn't working. I can squat the world, but I'm not getting that fast or I'm yeah. still stuck at this time. And uh, so it's always become kind of, I wouldn't call it a passion. I would mm. call it more of an obsession where it's a question that I can't completely answer. Yeah. Uh, and there is no Holy grail, but I refuse to accept that. So I continue to hunt. Uh, so I played at Northern Illinois. Then I was the G I was a GA at Northern Illinois back when there was one strength coach and two GAs and I was one of the two. So I had a whole bunch of teams and everyone worked with football. Right. And then out of there, I got a, I teach U S history. Um, I oh, got a no job. Kidding. Yeah. I'm a U.S. history teacher. Awesome. And I got a job at Hinsdale Central High School and the AD said, uh, you're going to be the strength coach. And I just said, yeah, that's a no brainer. That's what I want to do. And then he said, oh yeah, you're going to be a track coach too. Ah. And I said, well, I 
don't know much about track. And so my first year I got my ass kicked and I don't like that. <laughs> so I tried to apply my NSCA stuff, which worked at Northern. It seemed to work at Northern yeah, and it wasn't working. And so I had to have the courage to say, this isn't working. I mean, I even went out to West side barbell a couple of times and spent a week there and all that oh, and no learned everything. And I bought chains and I'm at a, a wealthy school. So, and I said, I want to buy a whole bunch of chains and a belt squat and four reverse hypers and four glute hams on that. We had it. We yeah. got it. Yeah. And eventually Louis said to me, you know, I'm not the answer for you. You need to look other places. Oh, um, and so I, I, mean, uh, I mean, West side barbell is just legendary. Oh, even, it is. Even folks who don't power lift have at least heard of it. You sure. Know? Yeah. And I would go to DeMorris Avenue at what was once a 7-Eleven, a blacked out 7-Eleven, or it was a blacked out pizza place. The 7-Eleven was next door. And they're dragging <laughs> sleds in the parking lot and all that. Yeah. Um, and so I just kind of started on this journey is how can we learn to get faster? And when I started to figure out a little bit, um, we started doing well. So I had this upper class school that was showing up in the finals in the four by one every year. It's state of Illinois and Illinois is a hot state for a Northern state. We run fast here. Yeah. Um, there was a falling out with the new football coach, which is a whole nother story in itself. Um, I went to another high school, York high school, famous for their cross country. I mean, world famous for their cross country. Oh, interesting. Okay. And, uh, they wanted me to take over the sprint program there and I did, and they let me do whatever I wanted to do. And we started winning state championships. And I, you know, at the same time, a guy by the name of Dan Fichter and I were screwing around back when message boards were a thing. And right. we had our own message board going, uh, super training and part of the super original super training. And then it merged, went into something else. Uh, and I started writing articles for DB Hammer. Yeah. And that's where, you know, people started. I, I think I pissed everyone off when <laughs> I wrote why we don't squat. And it was like blasphemy back then. I oh, literally got yeah. I literally got physical threats. People emailed me physical threats. One guy said he's going to come and break my pencil neck. Well, at the time I was 34 years old. I bench pressed 400 pounds. Yeah, I played football in college, so I, I know how to hit people right. and stuff like that. And then I have a a pack of dogs that probably wouldn't take to that very well. But people physically <laughs> threatened me to come hurt me because I wrote squatting was bad. It was kind of cool because the morning after that, I wrote that within 24 hours, I had an email from someone from every continent on the planet, except for Antarctica. No kidding. It's, and that was kind of, that was a, that was a career marker for me where I thought, holy shit, this is kind of cool. Right. It's unbelievable to me why that is so polarizing. And I guess, is it is it mostly just a lot of these programs are steeped in like tradition? Uh, tradition might not even be the right word. Uh, but yeah, what they did, what they love, what they know how to coach, it makes yeah. sense. Um, and I'm at the point now, I've been doing this for, I've been a high school teacher for 29 years. I've been coaching for 31. And people like to get in this argument with me. And I've eventually ended by saying, listen, life would be much easier for me if we could just go into a squat rack and I could get kids to run four, four forties or yeah. 10, 500 meter dashes. Yeah. If it were that easy, I would have been there already, but I've tried it. I've tried it a million different ways. Hmm. I've been to West side. I've, we've had chains on the bars. I've had these different bars. You know, I've, I've tried everything and it, it just doesn't work for me. It may work for you. And if it works for you, that's great, but let's go down the state track meet and see how it goes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, so interesting. Cause, uh, are you from, do you know Gavin McMillan at all out of sports science lab in uh, Irvine, California? No. So um, he, I would say, I, I don't know to the extent that you guys are completely aligned, but has a similar philosophy. And I think he also has kind of taken a very alternative approach, um, both like to training and rehabilitation and long story short, uh, just by sheer dumb luck, I ran into him in California when I was training, I think in between my sophomore and junior year, maybe my freshman and sophomore year and not a, not a barbell in the gym, no squat racks, none of this traditional stuff that I'd always been accustomed to doing. 
And of course, lo and behold, at the end of that summer, I didn't, I literally did not lift a weight. I was stronger. I was faster. I was more explosive. And that was kind of my first introduction to like, whoa, there is a different way to do things. And it actually might be better yeah. than what I've kind of been taught up to this point. So it's interesting to hear, uh, you know, already your perspective that you kind of like, you know, through your own. And, I, th and, and, and I think people get hooked on an exercise or a name yeah. instead of let's just call it what's what's it going to take to get this person to get to their goal? Hmm. You know, let's let's get rid of the names and the categories. Are we in the weight room? Are we on the track? How about let's just, just call it exercise. What exercise are we doing today? Sprinting is an exercise. It's the most complicated exercise that we do as humans. Yeah. Squatting is an exercise. And if you know what, if I can get some of their squat to go up and they run faster, I'm going to use it. Yeah. But in my experience, it just has not been the the golden ticket for me. And I remember yeah. the first time, uh, one of the first times J.L. Holdsworth and I met. Now, he was a big power lifter. Hmm. I told him that I dragged my power rack out to the garbage and put it out at the garbage one day. And he threatened to punch me in the face. <laughs> he goes, you're, you're giving me anxiety. I want to punch you in the face right now. And I said, well, it didn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> if people hold it, really, hold it really near and dear, for sure. They do. They do. But well, I think I've gotten past the point of that. And I said, hey, what makes people – because really, if you play football yeah. or if you're on track or whatever sport that you have, it comes down to how fast can you run. And the reason why that is is you increase the ceiling of what your body can do. Hmm. Uh, during this COVID time, I've been on all kinds of conference calls with all kinds of different people. And we it's kind of a strange scenario – a guy from the Celtics had me on and we were talking with a bunch of, I don't know, it was a weird situation because Jay had me on and we've been chat and I've been looking at film of his guys and uh, he goes, Hey, can you jump on a conference call tonight? I said, sure. Um, <laughs> you know, things were slow at the time. You know, everyone was still, you know, <laughs> stuck in their away. House. <laughs> and uh, all these people start popping up that some of them I recognized, some of them I didn't, I certainly didn't speak to any of them before. Yeah. And there were all kinds of people from all over the NBA. And the question was, what are we missing in the NBA to, to make our players last longer and better athletes and things like that? And I said, they've forgotten how to sprint. Um, hmm. They've lost that top percentage of their ceiling when they've forgotten how to sprint. And what was kind of cool is if you go back and you watch Last Dance, which – I'm, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I think well. everyone knows I'm from Chicago. I'm pretty proud of that, even though <laughs> we got a crazy state. Yeah. Uh, oh, the last, the last dance, let me just start by saying it was so awesome. And it wow. after, for 10 episodes, when that 10th episode ended, I was like, ah, oh. what's next? Well, yeah, what, what like, am what? I going to do for life? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, but watching Jordan sprints, watching the sprints, watch how Jordan is Doran, everyone. And this is at the end of his career. Yeah. He always kept that. And I I was lucky enough uh, that I was I got to see Jordan play once, and I kind of had a clue about life when I went to the game. And uh, I still don't have much of a clue, but a little bit. And uh, <laughs> lo and behold, by far, he was by far the quickest person on the floor. I yeah. mean, night and day difference. Maybe Scottie Pittenpin was a close second. But they were head and shoulders or a whole step quicker than everyone on the floor. So when and you it, when you made that assessment about the NBA today, uh, I mean, I guess how, how did you kind of come to that assessment? Is it just like visually what you're seeing on the court, or just like well, you know? It, it started with uh, they were sending me film of guys and watching them run and stuff like that, and then oh. started said, "Hey, can you check this out? Check that out!" and uh, and just you know. You can see it. You can see that they are freak athletes, but they've lost that that top edge. Uh, and mm. they're quick. They can jump. But jumping is not nearly as neurologically taxing as sprinting. Oh, you know how to land. You're going to you're gonna jump to the height that you're comfortable landing from. Yeah. Um, but sprinting, I mean, that takes everything you got because you have to navigate in hundreds of a second. Right. Um, if you have people around you or obstacles, you have to navigate that. And uh, it just opens up what you can do. 
in a lot of sometimes, I'm not saying all the times, but sometimes sprinting, uh, your speed is what your neural system can tolerate, either from a protection level or what it can navigate, how it can track your hearing, your vestibular system, all that stuff. Hmm. It's kind of like a composite of everything that is going on from a neural standpoint combined into one thing. Hmm. And if you want to see something cool, if you don't believe me, if you got dogs and you take them out running, which yeah. I do illegally, uh, watch them sprint, <laughs> take them through a forest, watch them sprint and watch how they do it. Okay. Their eyes are forward, their ears open to the side. So now they're navigating from the side in case something comes at them from the side right. and watch them charge through a forest and never trip. Oh, yeah. And that's with four legs. Yeah. Not two. I don't think there's a lot of people that can navigate a city street anymore without. Yeah, because they're looking down at their feet. phone. Yeah. Oh, well, hey, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but yeah, if, if you want to take that one step further, you can look at the development of a cheetah over time. Um, there's a really hmm. cool study um, that looked at the development of cheetah and they're trying to figure out when did the cheetah make this big jump to go faster? Uh, the original research compared a, a greyhound and a cheetah. And they were looking at what made a cheetah that much faster than the greyhound. And, and really, the greyhound had more fast switch muscle fiber, more muscle mass. Oh, interesting. But what the cheetah had, and if we know a greyhound, they got that little pinhead, right? Yeah. They don't have the vestibular development that a cheetah has. The cheetahs, you know, those cool black stripes underneath their eyes? Yeah. That's actually all pitted out. That's their vestibular system that allows them to navigate. So they, this... Really? This guy figured that the cheetah ran faster because it could navigate at a faster speed and had more information that made them feel safe to let them go faster. Oh, wow. That, uh, man, that kind of brings, I, I've been really interested to learn the extent that like your brain in, in an effort to like protect yourself almost puts like a governor on like the output that it lets your your muscles put out, like or whether it be the contraction, the rate of control, the speed of, you know? I, I agree completely. Uh, and that's, I call it the Bo Jackson syndrome. Okay. Oh, Bo Jackson. <laughs> he, he's actually a neighbor. He lives in the gated community across the street. Oh, no kidding. So I see him out. Yeah. Um, he's a nice guy, friendly guy. I see him at the grocery store, see him at the Lifetime Fitness and all that. And he is a, he is still, something to behold. Um, yeah. But my thought was this. If you watch the 30 for 30 on him, he could do a backflip in waist deep water. That's not supposed to happen. You can't do that. And so what I think happened is Bo Jackson didn't have a governor. Yeah. And because he didn't have the governor, his fast twitch muscle fibers developed more where he got the mass and he could still perform with that mass. But it just got the point because there was no restriction on what he could do his hip broke. Yeah. I remember that. Oh, well, it's so funny too. Like the example of him doing a backflip in the water. I mean, there's, there's people who go viral on the internet just for jumping out of the pool. Yeah. And, and he water. can do a flip <laughs> or the story where he threw a ball through a house. Yeah. I love, I love <laughs> the Bo Jackson stories that 30 for 30. I might have to go back and watch that again. Just but like the, I, the tall tales of Bo Jackson. And maybe Herschel Walker to some extent or a Saquon Barkley or any one of those other guys that turn into that, that genetically develop that way. Right. Maybe it's not so much genes. It's more of a fact that their governor hmm. is less. Yeah. Like they don't have as much of a governor for protection. Hmm. Uh, kind of along the same lines, show me a kid that has really bad vision that's fast. Hmm. Go to go to sixth grade or seventh grade, and who's always last? It's the kids with the pop bottle glasses, right? Yeah. Maybe that's a governor that their body knows. I can't see shit. Yeah. Even though I got these things on, they may fall off at any time, and I'm going to fall. Right. So there's your governor. Yeah. Uh, Cal and I, Cal and I talk way too much. Um, <laughs> but we're starting to look at Paralympic stuff and blind runners to see what's actually going on with their body to see what the governor can be. Oh, very cool. I mean, the, the world champion 100 meter dash guy runs an 11 one, which isn't great. But remember, there's a guy that's dragging him along. And if you watch it, when he gets up to speed, wow. he's actually clipping. But when hmm. they accelerate, and he's not sure and he's in that scary position, their acceleration is horrible. Yeah, and you're almost stumbling everywhere. 
Right. And so it's not even that physically he doesn't have the capability to get going, but it's kind of like, to your point, he doesn't have these the, the same inputs to kind of like to guide. shut off the forebrain or you know whatever you want to say. Hmm. That's really interesting. Hey, w- one of the things uh, I wanted to ask you, and we've kind of started to dabble around this a little bit, is um, you know your willingness to. And then, by the way, I'm sorry for taking away off topic. No, this is great. <laughs> My daughter is going to be so fired up that cheetahs made their way into this podcast. You have no idea. But but one of the things I think is is interesting and apparent, uh, and I loved kind of like digging into a lot of the, you know, the information that you've put out there historically, everything from like how your gym is set up to the way you approach training with your athletes. But it, it seems like there's very much so willingness to kind of buck the status quo. Um, and, you know, I would love to hear a little bit about kind of – has it has it always been that way? Was it once you started to get positive feedback from some of these kind of new and innovative approaches, there was like more of a willingness to dive in? Like, can you kind of talk a little bit about like how that process uh, works from your perspective? Um, I'm not married to anything. Uh, once you stop to defend, you can't move, you can't grow. Once you stop on a rock, you're not going to go anywhere, right? Yeah. So I don't have any connections to any exercises or anything like that. Um, Mm. I try to have a beginner's mind where everything is new and novel. Uh, I think the more you go into new experiences with an innocence or maybe even naivete, uh, the more you're going to learn. Yeah. And so when we come up with new ideas and things like that, I'll try it. I have nothing to lose by trying it. I mean, I'm a guy that trains out of his street. Now, what have I got to lose? Yeah. Um, so, re- and remember, my obsession is this golden chalice, you know, that supposed to be the answer for everything. And I'm still looking, you know, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a questing person. Okay. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Cal and I are kind of the same way and we get dangerous because our mentality isn't, you'll never hear, yeah, but come out of our mouth. Uh, ah. Once you say, yeah, but you can't improvise and create. We're more, yeah, and, and then, and then, yeah, and. And really, that's where we come up with the ideas. And most of our stuff, well, I would say most, some of our stuff is crap. Sure. Like, and then having an honesty and an openness with your athletes where they say, yeah, coach, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> this sucks. Can we yeah. try it one more time? No, coach, this is just bad. Okay. Hey, sorry. It took five minutes out of your life. We know this doesn't work, but let's try this. Yeah. What if I did this? Uh, we were playing around with the 1080 last night and we're doing, uh, 1080's got a new contraption that you're connected to. And I hit a remote control and the tow line come pops off. Oh, so I cool. can pull you up at 12 meters a second and then I pop it off. And so yeah. we're watching film while we're doing this. And and I have one interesting guy. He's uh, he's out of college. He's actually uh, he has a PhD in rocketry, but he's trying to make the Pakistani Olympic team as a sprinter. Oh, awesome. Um, so when we're talking all this science stuff, I mean, this guy's way smarter than I am. And we're going through this and we're watching. And I film everything and delete yeah. most of it. Um and we were looking at getting pulled and we said, you know, this might be better if we take the belt and we strap it around your chest. That way you're not getting pulled and lean back. And so we connected. I just, all right, let's try it and put it up, connected it. We're doing speed bounds into a sprint hmm. because what I'm trying to do is on the Ken Clark research where we're looking at the split between the legs and how fast you can get that leg into the ground. Ah, okay. and, it's, and it's a great drill because I can actually get that tangential force that he's looking for that it's probably actually a major dictator and how fast you run it's the only Hmm. drill i've been able to do that Hmm. uh and then i pop it off uh and then you get into a into a sprint and hope to hold that tangential force through your foot i'm I'm sorry i'm drawing pictures in the air with my hand Um, no it makes sense it makes sense and so we just changed it we moved the belt around it worked really well i was like holy shit this works pretty good i got goosebumps (laughs) let's go with it (laughs) So oh, I, love it. I, I think it's just the ability to create, innovate. I wouldn't call it innovate, but create and make changes based on what you see right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you have to be really be present for when you train. 
Hmm. So I don't have a lot of film because I can't film and be present at the same time. I can't be there to help change and, and, and create if, you know, I'm too busy taking pictures of guys doing stuff and things like that. Yeah. Um, Sounds so like- that's kind of how it comes along. And then I'll send a film over to Dan Fichter or Cal Dietz and we'll talk about it. And they'll say, hey, try this next time and film it. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Or, or Cal will say, hey, put the plasma gun on him. And I said, I'm not dragging the plasma gun out to the street or anything like that. <laughs> I can't do that. He goes, I know, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So, I mean, you know, as I've gotten older, one, like I actually don't have anything really concrete that I'm training for, but I'm beginning to have more fun just even in my own workouts, just trying to experiment a little bit, uh, throw variation into exercises that normally have been like pretty static for me over time. Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah. Well, and so one thing I I would love your take on is... I think it's one thing to be open to change and innovation, right? Um, but I have to imagine that there's another element that probably sets guys like you and Cal apart is the ability to assess like, hey, what is actually like worthwhile? What's working? Um, so, you know, I don't know to the extent that maybe you have uh, like formalized the real like, uh, I don't know, rubric that you measure everything by, but kind of you know, how, how do you go about assessing like, hey, what's working? And, you know, hey, this was fun, but maybe it's something that we put on the shelf. Uh, I watch to see if there's a change. Okay. Um, I don't have, I do have a lot of measuring stuff. And, you know, ultimately I do throw a lot of stuff in. So my recipe for pizza is going to be different every time. Um, so I hate to say this, but that's where the art of coaching comes in. Yeah. And I go with my gut. Um. And that's why it's hard to replicate what I do sometimes because uh, that's the art. Yeah, I can do a paint by numbers and you can do pretty well. I mean, I've got a whole bunch of videos up on TFC with ideas that I have. Yeah. Uh, But it's got to be an art because where I live, it's going to get cold. It's going to get windy. It's going to do all these different things outside. Mm -hmm. No. I don't have, uh, you know, I may not have access to a track, so it's got to, it's got to move and change. Yeah. Um, Well, I have to imagine too, it's like, you know, you've been coaching for 31 years. I mean, if, if you even tried to calculate how many different runners you've worked with and just like the sheer experience and probably your ability, I would imagine to just instantaneously, instantaneously, like see what's important. That probably is impossible to replicate, you know, unless that's you just hard, have yeah. a sheer amount of input. Yeah, I think, and that's part of, that's wisdom. That's where wisdom comes into play. Mm. It's where, you know, I know it's, if I'm cooking, I know it's spice to put in, or if I'm playing a guitar solo, I know that all I need is that one note. Yeah. Like Miles Davis always said, you know, if you can just hit that one note, that's all you need. Huh. And so that's really the art of what separated Miles Davis from everyone else is he knew the one note, B.B. Hmm. King. In most B.B. King guitar solos, he plays three notes. Hmm. Man, he plays those three notes better than anyone else. You, when you're done listening to his solo, he almost tells a story with those three notes, and you can walk away singing his solo. Yeah. I mean, that's wisdom. Um, can he shred like Eddie Van Halen? I don't know, but did he need to? No. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying Eddie Van Halen's any slouch either. Eddie Van Halen could play a million notes, but he can make those million notes swing like nobody's business, which what is what put him separated him from anyone else. Right. Right. I won't get into music. I won't do music analogies. No. Anymore. Hey, look, if you, uh, I mean, I don't know where you stand on uh, 90s grunge, but that's basically what I grew up with in Seattle. So uh, we can we can go there if you want. But uh, I don't think they're uh, necessarily beloved by the guitar community. You want to hear my Pearl Jam story? <laughs> I would, yes, I would love to. So I'm in, it's, I'm in first year graduate school at Northern. Okay. 
Red Hot Chili Peppers and Smashing Pumpkins were coming to play at the at the Duke Ellington Ballroom. And they had a third band that nobody had ever heard of because this oh. album 11 hadn't come out yet. And so Pearl Jam opened for Smashing Pumpkins and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. At so Illinois. we went at Northern Illinois. We went and it was probably a quarter full and they rocked. Yeah, They tore the roof off the place. And we didn't know any songs or anything like that. All we knew is these guys can really play. Yeah. So after the show, they came out and they started hanging out and talking with the <laughs> the, the, the hundred people that are there. And because I was there with all my football buddies, you know, I was a wide receiver. I'm 6'1". Yeah. These guys are, I went with the linemen, so they're 6'4", 6'5". And of course, everyone wants to gravitate to the big guys. Everyone wants to be friends with the big guys in case yeah. there's a fight. So, I, was gonna say, I think that's like some sort of evolutionary probably mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> and so we had one guy named Jumbo, of course, everyone's going to, and he's uh, in it was great going with them because that was mosh pit days. Okay. <laughs> and so I just went behind them and we were, uh, we always got front row. <laughs> but yeah, that was my first Pearl Jam awesome. concert. Well, yeah. And then, I mean, I have to, have you seen him in Wrigley? I have not seen him at Wrigley. Oh. I, I, I won't go to a show at Wrigley because you can't park. Oh, no kidding. There's no parking at Wrigley Field. Oh, see, I, I still haven't made it out there. My uh, One of my best friends from college is, I mean, he sang Pearl Jam at his own wedding just to give you a taste <laughs> of how big of an Eddie Vedder fan this guy is. And uh, yeah, every like every year or two, I hear about like new and creative ways that he scalped his way into Wrigley to hear Pearl Jam. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I saw Pearl Jam open up for Tom Petty. That was a pretty good show. Oh, man. That I would think that was awesome. 98, 99, something like that. God, that'd up be at Milwaukee Fest. That's awesome. You anyway. Know, yeah. No, this is, good. <laughs> this is more interesting than ever I was going to talk about. Um, well, perfect. No, I, I love that. And uh, I think I'm just so interested in, in – because I think it's so relatable to whatever your pursuit is. And I'm always interested in folks who seem to have had the ability to, like, take an alternative approach, become an expert. I'm always curious kind of how that happens. Um, a lot of failure. A lot of trial and failure. Hmm. Um a, a constant inquisitiveness, you know, constantly questioning what you're doing and never being satisfied with with what you're with what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and we know so little about the human body, and we know so little about sprinting. Interesting. Uh, I mean, really, um, we got a long way to go, hmm. and I know that. Um, and I want to be part of the solution, you know, because it's a question that I think I will take with me to my my deathbed. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so interesting because I, I just uh, – I guess it hasn't come out yet. It'll it'll be out next week. I, I always tip my hand as to when I actually record these things if people are paying attention. <laughs> um, but we, we had on uh, Do Dr. Sherry Ma. She's a sleep expert. She works with a number of, you know, professional organizations, professional sports teams on everything from, like, how to schedule a season to how an individual player – uh, should kind of like try to optimize their sleep. And she started off the show saying like, look, we still don't know why people sleep. Let me, yeah. just, let me just start there. And it's just like, you spend a third of your life doing it. It's just, it's incredible how much, it, how much. And we're such for suckers for information that you have to have eight hours of sleep. Well, why? Yeah. We don't know why. Why is that the magic number? Because uh -huh. someone couldn't made a meme out of it and it, <laughs> made it into social media and that that's our dr we take drugs to make sure we get eight hours of sleep yeah uh, is that really that good i don't know yeah or why it happens or what the processes are that actually yeah. take place and it's just it's just incredible um one of the things actually that i that i wanted to make sure we talk about and actually we started talking about it before we were recording but you have a new project coming out correct i do don't you what's my project Activation? Am I messing this up completely? What, what was the oh, RPR? Well, I was going to ask you about RPR, but I, I thought there was well, something. Be else. activated. Be activated. I'm sorry. That is Douglas Heels. Kind of show am I running here? <laughs> Douglas Heel is the one who started. That's his program that we changed into RPR. Be activated ah, okay. is where a, someone puts their hands on someone else. Yeah. RPR is a derivative of that. 
where you do it to yourself. And that's why RPR is different from all the other things out there is because you can actually do this to yourself. Okay. Yeah. I would, I would absolutely love to, to dive into this a bit more. And so be activated. So Douglas was coming and I was sponsoring and he would come twice a year and he would run be activated clinics Hmm. where you would put your hands on people. Yeah. Now in a lot of States, it's illegal to put your hands on people if you're not licensed. Ah, and so what happened was Cal hosted one up in Minneapolis eventually. And at that point, we asked Douglas, hey, can we run one of these without you and we'll give you a percentage? Mm. And he said, OK. And so JL hosted it. And that's where JL said to us, hey, because JL always starts questions with, hey, I'm serious. <laughs> and uh we can make this into something better. This is too good to just have to a select group of people who paid a lot of money to put their hands on people. Yeah. We can't do that. And our first hit on that is when we went to Penn State. JL went to Penn State and they said, this is great stuff, but we can't do this because after the Jerry Sandusky things, you can't put your hands on people. Well, I was going to say, yeah, there's, there's been a number of high profile cases where it's, yes. it might not be the business you want to necessarily subject yourself to. So we'd made RPR taking some of Douglas's stuff. Hmm. And so we have a level one, which is just the resets. Uh, in fact, we have a, a the, the class is available online and it's 11 hours and it's actually really good. Oh, wow. Um, all three of us teach it in different ways Okay, uh, to take you through that. There is a level two, which will be out soon online, which is the why everything happens hmm. and all the different tests that go with it to make sure it happens. And then we have a, a personal video that's coming out for 60 bucks and it just takes you through the resets. You'll be done. Uh-huh. It walks you through. You'll be done in the first time, half an hour. When I reset myself, it takes me about two minutes. No kidding. Can, can you talk a little bit about what that actually is for, for folks who might be saying like, what, what the heck is a reset? So a reset is, we call them wake up drills or a reset. So yeah. there are parts on your body that will respond in a way that will get a muscle to work. So sometimes muscles may be inhibited. Mm-hmm. They may not give the power output you want, or just maybe an outright compensation pattern and the sucker is not moving at all. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, whether an athlete or not, can probably relate to this from just sitting at their desk. That's right. Exactly. Sitting at a desk forces you into what we call a a fight or flight state. You go into flexion. Flexion is for protection. Hmm. Think about it. When when you flex up, you curl into a ball, right? You're protecting yourself. Eventually, you end up in a fetal position, which is the ultimate defense position. Yeah. So... Just sitting at a desk, hunched as, over, looking at your computer screen, I you hunched, are putting yourself right now <laughs> in, into this fight or flight stage, uh, yeah. into a flexion dominant position. Whereas with RPR, we want to get you into a balance. And so to mm. get to a balance, we have to get more extensor or use the right flexors to help keep us tall. So for us, You know, we start with the reset in the psoas and there's a reset in the glutes, which to us, that's our core. Yeah. Everything emanates from a psoas initiating the movement. Mm -hmm. There's no way the psoas can take that whole leg through a swing and lift it. It's in a hugely disadvantageous position, but it starts the chain of events to get everything else to work. The psoas does. Once you move away from that position, you go into a compensation pattern which may result in a shortened stride. It may result in quad problems, ankle, all kinds of different problems. Because as you grind out in that compensation pattern, you wear down things because you're asking something to do two things at once. Hmm. Same with glutes. The glutes are going to be the initiator of that extension pattern. So there are spots, and we didn't invent the spots, and Douglas didn't invent the spots. They actually go back to uh, neurolymphatic reset spots and created or discovered by Chapman back in the 1880s, 1890s. Oh, interesting. That correspond to those spots. And actually the history of that is that originally they were, they're kind of a meridian slash acupuncture connection. 
Because ah, okay. if it's 1880 and someone says, hey, I think something's wrong with your kidney, let's do surgery. No, I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah. You go to the hospital to die in 1880 and 1890. Right. They cut into you. You're going to get infected. They don't know what they're doing. Exactly. So Chapman came up with these spots to try and treat the organs through these different spots. Interesting. And what it merged to was he found that there are corresponding spots with different muscles hmm. and that there are connections between organs and muscles. And, and, and he found all these different connections through these different things through the body. And not that, the, not that in Asia they hadn't discovered these things thousands of years ago. Yeah. It's just the racial component of America at the time probably wasn't ready to accept anything that came from Asia. Ah, uh. Yeah. In fact, the American Medical <laughs> Association is part of the entire uh, professionalization of medicine during the progressive movement with Teddy Roosevelt when they came out with the Pure Food and Drug Act with Harvey Wiley. They wanted to standardize everything, and they really wanted to get rid of anyone that had any idea or any types of treatment outside of what the American Medical Association was pushing at the time, no which kidding. meant that you had to go to medical school to be a doctor. Hmm. So if you're a chiropractor, they said, what's chiropractic? You crack some bones? When well, We don't accept that. Yeah. That's, not, that's quackery. And that was a term that they used. Huh. So if you chart the history of medicine at the time, you'll see that all these alternative, today what we call alternative medicines, completely disappear. People are practicing out of their basement, mm -hmm. out of a closet, because they didn't want to go to jail for what the AMA or in what the government, the progressive government said was right or wrong. Hmm. So when uh, anatomy trains come out or not, Adam, but uh, when Goodhart comes out with his applied kinesiology book in the fifties, that was earth shaking because it's the first time you see some form of medicine or some form of treatment that comes outside of what the AMA does. Oh, wow. And why might that be? Well, the Americans were in Japan. Americans were in, China, you had to say, maybe the Chinese stuff isn't so bad, or maybe what the Japanese are doing isn't so bad. Mm -hmm. So that's where it comes from. And so that's where it develops. And it took decades to get chiropractic to a place or applied kinesiology and all these different things that was accepted in society because the AMA was so powerful in what they could do using the pure food and drug acts that were started. Back when they were trying to figure out why people died when you drank milk, it's because they put bleach in the milk. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, well, and it's, I mean, to your point today, I feel like folks are much more receptive to, I guess, what traditionally would be like an alternative approach. Sure, because people realize they know friends that have had soldier surgery or whatever surgery on their body part, and they're still not great afterwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. And people don't want to get cut on. You know, there's in, in the way we look at things, it, what's great about RPR is you can unwind. If you use, if you look at the body through this lens of RPR, you can unwind and understand injuries why mm. things happen. And one of the great benefits that we've seen with RPR, and, I, and I've been using it for 11 years now, 12 years really, with, with my athletes, is we have a, a great decrease in injuries. Hmm. And when people my age do it, you feel like a kid again. I mean, hmm. the first time I got reset, and I'm not making this up, I got up off the table and I'm, I'm at this clinic. Actually, our first our first uh, clinic was at in a waiting room of a doctor's office. That was all I could get. Yeah. And so we moved out. I literally got up off the chair and I ran in the street. I, I ran right down the street and I felt like I was 16 again. I, I can't I can't believe this. This is phenomenal. I shouldn't feel like this. I shouldn't feel this light. I shouldn't be able to bend down and touch my toes. Huh. And I could. Is it just? Is it just, and I guess you, you have a, a whole new uh, video that's going to explain all this in a new uh, second system, but is it just that those muscles begin firing properly or yeah. is it? Your body went back to doing what it was supposed to do. It was moving the way it was designed to move. Getting away from these compensation patterns. Getting away from these compensation patterns. Yeah. So one, one thing, you know, I could go off on a bunch of different things on this idea, but 
that's basically what happens. And so you get injured because, or you feel like crap because you start compensating. Mm -hmm. And you can, the compensation pattern can come from physical, emotional, all these different things right. that will shut your body down. Like Cal never works out during finals. I mean, those he gives his kids off during finals because everyone gets hurt. Yeah, I do the same thing. It makes um, sense. You know, it's funny that you say that. That that's one of the things that as I've gotten older, uh, we didn't talk about this, but I've got three kids, full time job, and I've become much more acutely aware. Like in times of high either mental or emotional stress, I'm like, you know what? I need to, I need to back it off in these other areas because like it's all compounding. It is in ways that I did not appreciate. And maybe, you know, when you're 18 to 22, like you're pretty, you think you're pretty invincible. So, I mean, it didn't matter if I was out drinking all night, I was going to go in there and bench. But uh, yeah, now I'm like, you know what? I just, it's not, (laughs) it's not good for me to power through everything. No. Um, And, but that's what we do because we think that it gets rid of stress, Mm. but really beating up your body is stressful. Right. And it accumulates from all these different things. And it, it stress can be from the blue screen that we stare at all day doing Zooms. Stress can be from a smell. Uh, I drank, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I'm at the grocery store the other day and there was some kind of bovine drink, hmm. lemon ginger with uh, gelatin in it. And I thought, well, <laughs> I need gelatin, right? Because I read that somewhere that gelatin is good for you. Right. I drank it. It didn't taste right to me, Uh, but I thought, I've spent $4 on this. I'm going to finish this. Yeah, it must be part of the process. And it shut me down. Uh, So smells, light, uh, sound, all these different things have an impact, vibration, mm. because the first thing our body always responds to is vibration first, whether it's light. I mean, think about that. Someone shines a bright light in your face. It's an instant reflex. Yeah. You can't even control it. Mm Mm-hmm. You respond to that. Yeah. And, you, and you, you have to go back to basics. After you respond to the light, you have to find a horizon. These are the hierarchies of what you do. And if you, if you don't believe that, watch an MMA fight and watch someone get knocked out. They come to, there's, the light comes on, their eyes flex, and the first thing they do is they get up and try and find a horizon. Ah, oh, man, I love MMA too, so I'm going to start watching for that. So if you wear a mask all day, the mask isn't a straight horizon. Hmm. right? You're confusing your body because it's always trying to find a horizon. Yeah. If you don't believe me, go into a a workout room, make your bench go crooked. So when you look up the ceiling, the bar doesn't match the tiles in the ceiling. I so And and watch people, watch people decrease their bench press by five to 10% just because they can't find a horizon. It is so funny you say that. So I, I have a squat rack. Oh man, I maybe I shouldn't say this on this, but uh, I, I've got a squat rack. <laughs> I have a squat rack too. Okay. I do too. All I right. bought another one Ooh. after I threw the other one out. Okay, and uh, it's it's interesting. You know, I I actually do not like doing. I, I like like single leg, like quarter squats. You know, like I like doing things that at least involve like some sort of balance or coordination. Sure. Um, but I do love benching. I'm not going to lie. But my my squat rack. I do too until I get hurt. And then it yeah. takes me a, a month to get better. Then I go back to benching again. <laughs> yeah. People are like, where is he going with this? But what I'm trying to say is my squat rack has, has kind of worked itself, you know, to an Askew. angle. Yes. Yeah. Askew. Thank you. Caddy Wampus, some might Caddy say. Caddy Wampus. And it's no longer aligned with like the tiles above me. And I've noticed that I will actually put my bench in there at an angle to the squat rack, just so that when I get under the bar, like the bar is lined back straight. Yeah. Because I don't want to be the one doing it at an angle. It's so funny. You say that I've, I've done it. Didn't like it. Went out of my way to like, correct it. I just need to get my wife down there. If you're doing an interview with someone and you want to put them off, make the painting behind you at an angle and you're going to throw them off. Yeah. That's a good point. I'm going to start doing that to people who work in sourcing when I'm trying to close these deals. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. But that, that's what your body's looking for. Your body will always try to find a horizon. Oh, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, actually, and I'm very interested to learn more about, about the RPR. Um, and I know we're running. So anyway, to finish that story, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we started condensing it so we could take it out to the masses. And we mm-hmm. have been to, done a bunch with special forces, NFL teams, Big Ten, you know, most of the big colleges. Um, but now we're getting into schools because 
really the brain follows the body and the body follows the brain. And mm. if you're physically shut down, how can your brain not perform at its best? Yeah, We've even tied in vision with our PR in that how can a kid read well if their body is shut down? Yeah. How can they track? How can their eyes track when they can't, when they, when their body's not working right? Well, and it just speaks to, and I feel like people are beginning to understand, like, I, I do love reading about this stuff, but just how interconnected everything is, you know, to your oh. point, the reading to the body, but like the gut to the brain and your emotional, it's, uh, it's all tied together. It's a system. And, it, and what we've done in the AMA is with the American Medical Association is I'm a shoulder guy. Compartmental. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just do guts or I just do heart or I just do, but what are, what about the impact on the rest of the body after you right. cut into my spleen? <sighs> Did your spleen get better? Well, I don't know. You're telling me it got better, but everything else seems to not work very well. Well, your spleen's better. Yep. If it's you don't believe me, go see the nephrologist or whoever, and he'll tell you different. Well, those numbers off, so I'm going to give you this drug, but yeah. what impact is it going to have on this? Never do these guys come together. And, and my wife's a veterinarian, so she has a medical background. She does surgery, mm -hmm. and she gets compartmentalized, and we're kind of opposites where she's a yeah, but, because yeah. there has to be research and all this stuff. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's it feels a lot like the, the old saying, you know, to a hammer everything looks like a nail, right? That's right. Um, and that's a good one. Yeah, I'm use that. Yeah, hey man, that's you know, if you take nothing else from this conversation today, <laughs> you are welcome to have that. But it's funny, you know. It's, uh, sadly, my dad passed a few years ago, but uh, you know, and I wasn't there every day. But it's like every time I talked to him, there was a new specialist who prescribed a new drug. And over, oh, yeah. a short, over a certain amount of time, that new drug did not react well with the drug that the other specialist gave him. And it's just exactly what you're describing. It's like you go to all these people for these different issues, but they don't work in coordination. And in fact, yeah. it seems they actually work against each other more often than not. They do. Yeah. There's no globalist. There's no one that oversees the whole spectrum of what's going on. Right, right. Which is too bad, but that's that's how things get billed out. That's how insurance pays out. That's that's what happens. Yeah, apparently it's so a, I think a business on the one back of the, end. So one say. of the things with our PR is, you know, the three of us all coach some form or another. Mm -hmm. And that was a frustration is, you know, kids get hurt. Kids aren't coming back. It's taking forever in the in the rehab and all that and we did some stuff and you know kids get back faster kids don't get hurt um they're more resilient they're you know knock on wood since i've been doing this uh i have not had a hamstring problem with my sprinters uh that's incredible in all these years yeah that's really incredible i mean that's something that plagued me myself so with, with <laughs> rpr is is that and i guess I suppose it could be both is it something that you do uh regularly as like a preventative measure to keep your athletes kind of like, I don't know if optimal is the right word, but at least like everything functioning so here, as it should or. Here's what's great about that is it's so easy to do that you can do it at any time. Hmm. It take doesn't take very long at all. You can go through, you can just do what we call your zone one and stay pretty, pretty resilient. Uh, but once athletes know how to do it, they become responsible for themselves where this doesn't feel right. I know when this doesn't feel right, this is what's off. Go through my resets, go through my wake-up drills, and boom, it's back on. Hmm. Then with a coach, you can have a better conversation and say, hey, coach, when I do this exercise, because they know what it feels like when their hip is off or their glute is off or something doesn't feel right. Hey, when I do this exercise, this isn't feeling great. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I can say, hey, well, then this isn't a great exercise for you. Let's get rid of that. Yeah. Instead of staying to some cookie cutter program because I wrote it down on paper, I can say, hey, for Johnny, uh, RDLs aren't great or mini hurdle runs aren't great or anytime he turns the right, this comes off. And so I can have a better conversation with my athletes about what's working, hmm. but do a better job programming. And more importantly, I know how to put that. We all know how to put that back on to get them at 100 percent again. Yeah. So, for example, coming to a track practice, uh, we'll do that. That's the first thing we do is we do our RPR and then we'll go into whatever our workout is. I oh, have I have shit canned uh, all dynamic warm ups because really if you, if you do a dynamic warm up and you don't know what is driving, 
you could be warming up for an injury. So with RPR, mm. I know that, and why do we warm up? Well, it's to make sure the muscles are working. Well, with RPR, I know that the right muscles are working the way I want to, so I don't need to do a dynamic warm up. No I'd rather kidding. take that energy, whatever 20% to bounce around and do all my Russian dance kicks and things like that, and put them into a workout or more specific drills that might actually help that athlete rather than just do a warm up out of tradition. And so it looks good at practice. So when the AD comes out and said, well, where's your warm up? Well, if you see them dancing around in that straight line, there's their dynamic warm up. We're, we're covering all that stuff. Yeah. Wow. Because okay. how much, so how I'm, much of a warm up is out of tradition? Oh, um, do you want to, do you want to hear? Cause I can tell you, we, I know <laughs> we, uh, and things have changed and I don't want to speak poorly cause I actually like a lot of these people. But uh, we would go so far as we would do one warm up for practice when no one was in the stands. It would be more dynamic in nature. But on game day, when we were actually going to perform, we would revert back to a more traditional warm up that, like, I guess looked better to spec. That's right. we, we would literally have a different warm up on game day than what we did in the summer, in the fall throughout camp, throughout the week. And I mean, sure. I just remember the time being like, this makes no sense. <laughs> like, and, and it's all out of fear because the AD shows up at the game. He doesn't know shit about training, mm -hmm. but he knows what a traditional warm-up looks like. And he looks out there and you're doing some kind of crazy stuff. He goes, oh, what the hell is that? That doesn't look like any warm-up I know. Right. When I played, we we did static stretching, and why aren't you doing that? We and would do we would switch to static stretching on game day, and I would, but you know, look, if static stretching happens to be the best approach, fantastic. Why are we not yep, doing this? The not, why are we not doing this the other ninety percent of the year? Yeah, I mean, the, I, we could have a whole three part series about this. So a lot of a lot of what we do is out of tradition and fear because if you do something different. And for any reason something doesn't go right, you, they will always pick out the person who did something different and mm. blame it on them. Yep. Very true. You put your neck out there. Um, and so to keep their jobs, people do what what's expected. So they don't rock the boat so they can keep their job and say, hey, we had two hamstring pulls last week. It must be that dynamic warm-up you're doing. It's all on you. Yeah. And, and strength coach is always the first to take the hit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never mind that the wide receiver coach has you running a thousand fades, <laughs> <laughs> right? Or anything like that. It's we didn't do enough hamstring work in the off season. How come we didn't do uh, Nordic boards? We bought the Nord board. I didn't see my guys on it. They said we don't do it much because they said you don't like it. Right. We got hamstring pulls because you didn't do Nord boards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it's like I enjoy feeding my family, so. Yeah, and I like my job. I mean, it's a good job. It's it's exciting, and I get to work with athletes, but, you know, so it yeah. becomes that balance point. Yeah. Because there's a lot of good coaches in the NFL that know a lot of stuff, but they can't they can't take their gloves off for fear that someone's going to rat them out for not being doing what Team X is doing that they saw on Hard Knocks. Well, you know what's um, interesting? A, a buddy of mine that I played with, he's he's been a veteran. I think it's his seventh or eighth season. And he came on with the Cowboys halfway through the year. And he had, um, you know, over the course, he's he's learned what his body responds to. He doesn't touch a barbell anymore. Um, he does a lot of, like, functional uh, exercises and strength-based training. And he feels like he moves better. He stays healthier. And he met. He was talking about this on the podcast. Uh, his defensive line coach had took a real issue with it to the point where he was like, look, you want me to squat? And it was after a game. I think that I don't remember who they played, maybe the Cardinals or something. After the game, he went in, threw like 500 pounds on the squat rack, did one rep, and he was like, are you happy? He's like, can I just get yeah. back to playing now? Like, I know what works. Squatting is not what's like gotten me to where I am today. Um, but yeah, it's an uphill battle, I, I have to imagine. It is. Uh, so that's why training out of my garage, I can do whatever I want. And if I get good results. And so to answer your initial question, yeah, that's kind of how I caught on as I wrote these articles with different ideas and people started showing up. People started bringing me out. Um, a lot of cool opportunities, meeting a lot of cool things. You know, the first time a high school coach gets to walk, gets invited into a NFL place where they want to hear what you have to say. 
It's awesome. You know, it, it's a, one of those pinch me moments that yeah. you would never expect. And then next thing I know, I'm traveling around the world talking. Uh, you see, I got on a rose right here. This I is know. my this is my COVID failure. Uh, I got hired by England Rugby Union to travel with them this summer in Japan. Oh no! And way. then that fell through. <laughs> So what came in the mail was <laughs> some of my uniform clothes that I was supposed to wear. Yeah. And then it all got canceled. Oh. Um, but, you know, because I think outside the box and there are places that are outside the box. Uh, when I was in New Zealand this last fall and I spoke at the Sprints, I was the keynote speaker at the Sprints conference. Hmm. Uh, Sprints is How Auckland amazing. University of Technology. Uh, that is the largest sports research facility in the world. Uh, yeah. After my time there, they hired me as an advisor and a graduate advisor uh, to help people do better research. That's amazing. Yeah. It, wow. So yeah, it, it's just, I, I guess perseverance, I guess I've been at it longer than most people. And eventually you throw enough shit on the wall, it sticks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I have to feel like too, it, it's the perseverance paired with the fact that you have been willing to innovate, like I said, buck tradition and get, get results at any cost. Right. And I mean yeah. that again, in, in the best way possible. Um, yeah, it's, well, and I, boy, I wish we had a little bit more time because unfortunately I have a hard stop. That's never happened before, but, uh, you know, just, I, I love the shots of the gym that you have built out in your basement. Right. And it, there's not very many traditional contraptions in there. And I was, really interested in like all the different surfaces you create. And I believe you have most of your guys work out barefoot, correct? We do. Yeah. Uh, sometimes barefoot, sometimes different shoes, different things. But like I said before, your body responds to waves and then surface. Uh, instantly, your body has to moderate based on what your feet feel. Hmm. And so to improve that chain, we change surfaces. Uh whether they're uneven, whether they're softer, they're harder or whatever. So you constantly are modulating to give the idea that, hey, it's okay if it's a little softer or a little harder, I can still go hard. I can still mm -hmm. push hard. Uh, Matt Van Dyke, who was at University of Texas, now he's with the Texans, the Houston Texans. Mm -hmm. He did something cool at University of Texas where he built out a floor and each mat had a different density. So oh, every time cool. you took a stride, it was something different. And that's oh, not my wow. idea. So like, like you could like you could sprint and like yeah. over the course of that gate, you're actually hitting a different every step density. is different. Oh, and that's wow. not I didn't invent that. I stole that. That is from from Carmelo Bosco, hmm. who's a brilliant Italian researcher who died in the 90s. Uh, he's the guy that invented the vibrating platform, the, the vibration platforms. I actually had one of those for a while. I hmm. had one of the original ones and it worked really well. Hmm. Um, the other shit that everyone made afterwards wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> he was kind of the Italian Veroshansky, the ah, Italian okay. biometric guys. Yeah. And he was brilliant. Brilliant. He had a lot of great ideas. Some was, hypergravity is a great idea. Um, you wear a weight vest and then you take it off when you actually train and your body mm. starts to believe that you're actually 12 or 15 pounds heavier. So it has to take the governor off to get ready for that extra weight. And then you make that change. I had some huge improvements in vertical jump doing that. Is that, is that uh, kind of similar to the way in the, the French contrast, you kind of overload your body with that first strength-based exercise so that when you move to like a... Oh, this is a little different. You're living with that weight on. So it's cool <laughs> for the first couple of days that you got on this cool vest. Oh, no way. So you're wearing the vest like every day, like around... Yeah, I have people that sleep on. in it. Oh, wow. And so because when I've you sleep, that extra, the, that extra weight into your chest yeah. actually requires you to put out more energy. Oh, wow. Um, so Titan, T-I-T-I-N, used to make really good weight vests. They went out of business for some reason. Hmm. And so Bosco said, hey, 13%. Now, Hank Krajinov had a great story why he came up with 13%. Hank was pushing him to, <laughs> to come up with a number so they could publish it. And he just yelled out 13 <laughs> Not that it meant anything. And Hank said, the, the percentage doesn't matter, but we're so stick on having the exact number to make sure yeah. it's perfect to do it exactly right. But if you understand the concept, so my kids that do it the first couple of days, it's fun. Uh, by the end of the week, they're exhausted. Yeah. Uh, week two, 
their caloric intake is doubled and they're burning body fat like nobody's business. Really? Oh, yeah. Because I guess the, to the body, I mean, it, it doesn't know where the weight's coming from. It's just no, no. this is the new normal. This is the new normal. We've got to put out more. Oh, wow. I've had it work really well with some athletes. I've yet to have a negative, but really, it sucks. <laughs> People quit after a couple of days like this sucks. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. This is not fun. I thought it'd be fun, uh, but it's not fun. Yeah. You're showering with it on. It's terrible. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, so, um, one last thing I would love, I would, I would be upset with myself if I didn't bring it up the spring ankle complex. Mm -hmm. I have had an absolute blast trying to add that into my, uh, my workouts. And I'll be honest for folks who haven't tried it yet. It is way harder than it looks. Let me start. If let me you're, start by if you're an older guy like us, yeah. that's the first thing that go are your feet and your ankles. Look at old people at the, like at the, the complex where my dad lives, they all shuffle around their feet suck. Oh yeah. Well, and to your um, point, I, I can't remember if you said this earlier, but it's, you know, we, I mean, just wearing shoes, like it seems like such a great advancement, but in actuality, like it, it forces you to like, I don't know, you don't need the same, you don't get the same sensory input, right? No. And, and shoes are, they can either be ergogenic, which they're going to improve performance or they can hinder performance. We buy shoes based on price and looks and who else is wearing them. Yeah. And really like I'm I bought a pair of on shoes because my wife loves them. And I thought I'd try them and I'd buy them. Well, it's got that carbon fiber bar in the middle of it, oh. which, you know, and I tried it on in the store, it felt fine, but it wrecked my ankle rocker mm. and it froze up my knee because my knee tried to be the ankle rocker because the shoe was taking my way, way the ability for my ankle to work properly. Hmm. And I've had other pairs of shoes that did it, uh, that have done similar things. Um, but in a, in a larger aspect, think about if you put on a really tight pair of shoes or shoes that are really jacked up in some way, and it really changes the way you work. That's yeah. a, that's a expanded version of what happens with a pair of shoes that really don't fit well for you. And they don't do what your foot needs it to do, which is to guide you, or in some cases, just protect you from stones on your feet. Right. Right. So back to spring ankle model, um, Anyway, your answer to your question is about shoes and that shoes can hinder that and barefoot actually helps. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and, so and go I, ahead, your question. No, I'm sorry. I, no, no, this is great. And I, I just, uh, what I guess there's a couple of things that were really interesting to me is one, it's very easy to think like, hey, I want to get faster. Let me go spend my time in the gym. Let me do squats. Let me do lunges. Let me do all these things, right? right. Um, and like I, you said this earlier, you know, like, yeah, hey, squats and exercise. And I guess if you want to get better at squatting, like you can squat more, that's great. Um, but after I started reading the stuff that you and Cal did around the spring ankle complex, this idea of like energy leaking out and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the foot being what primarily con it, the only thing that contacts the ground when you're running. And if you have a weak foot, a weak ankle, like energy is going to like dissipate and you're not going to be able to like capture all of that for, and I was just, it was such like a revelation and I was like, how at no point, and actually when I, when I worked at that sports science lab, we did a lot of feet stuff, which was awesome. But I was like, how in all my, you know, athletic endeavors were we never training the foot? Like this should be so obvious. <laughs> yeah, because kind because of it missed. is obvious. You yeah. have a foot, it should work, but it doesn't. Um, mm. Everything happens around the foot. Everything is a response to your foot hitting the ground at that velocity or speed or that force. Yeah. So... You have to absorb that energy. Otherwise, remember the goal is to not break your neck. That's the ultimate goal that your body plays. That's what it really cares about, right. And it's got to dampen the force before it gets to your neck. So oh. ideally that foot dampens a lot of force. Part of that dampening is are the foot pads on your feet. Hmm. Fat dampens energy, right? Yeah. Um, so that's why we have fat pads and that's why dogs have fat pads and elephants have fat pads. Now, the, as a tra if you don't have fat pads because you didn't go barefoot enough, that force has got to go somewhere else. And that may travel into your ankle, your knee, your hip, your lower back, your opposite armpit, maybe even into your neck. Yeah. So your job as an athlete is to A, learn how to dampen the force as quickly as possible 
so other things don't have to compensate and dampen the force. So the rest of your body can spend its time pushing, hmm. propelling. Um, like just by big toe function being off, someone, I think the Bezdris brothers in Ireland came up that it's 30% that doesn't come back just by not having a, a fat pad on your big toe, your big toe, missing your big toe. Oh, and, I, wow. and I don't say actually your big toe, the fat pad of your big toe. So like by not engaging that properly and not letting that be, uh, what do you mean by that? Like, it's like, it's not like actively participating in absorbing. And so when you the hit the floor, that fat pad never descends. So oh. there's no, there's no fat to, to how old is your youngest? Nine months. So, <laughs> Do I, do I look that tired? No. Uh, <laughs> grab where the joint for their big toe is. Okay. And feel how there's no fat there. You can go right to the bone. Oh, wow. Okay. It feels just like grabbing your thumb knuckle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Then go to someone who a pretty good athlete that runs pretty well, and there's going to be like a dog pad. You know, dogs have pads. Oh, yeah. That's all fat. They're going to have like a dog pit underneath that underneath that joint. Oh wow! Hey, so here, here's a question. Something that I thought that develops about. over time. It develops over time. Well, that's what I was going to. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I've I've as I've read the book and thought about this, for for folks who are naturally uh, incredibly fast, elite sprinters, is is a big contributing factor to that that for some reason they have built up that like strong foot. Or they have like the right motor patterns where they have built this up over time, or do you know what I mean? Like, is that one of like the the differentiating factors? It's a, it's a factor? factor. It is it's a yeah. factor. Um, I've never seen a really good sprinter that had bad feet. Hmm. I mean, maybe bad feet shaped, but a functioning foot that was strong is always a key. Interesting. Now you've seen good sprinters who are skinny, big good sprinters that are jacked. I mean, just look Alice and Felix against all the Jamaican girls. I mean, yeah. you couldn't be any more different. But if you look at their feet, their foot functions all the same. Huh. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting, you know, as I talked about, everything's going to be response to what happens to that foot on the ground. And people are worried about arm swing and things like that. And they'll sit and do, we're going to do arm pumps and sit on the ground and, you know, perfect arm swings and hold the butterfly with your hand, you know, all that shit. Yep. But if you watch that arm swing is going to be a compensator for whatever the foot doesn't do, the arm will do. Because oh, wow. again, we're going to go for a horizon. We have a target. We're going to run for the target. And our body knows, well, I'm coming off early on my foot. I need to get to the target. So I'm going to swing my arm more. Hmm. And all this time we're drilling arm movement and things like that. Perfect. It's really a, a function of what your foot does. And if you don't believe me, there's an awesome documentary on Netflix right now called Rising Phoenix. Oh, okay. It's about the history of the Paralympic Games. Oh, and it's cool. phenomenal. The history is great. I like history. I apologize for liking history. I think if you don't understand history, you don't get shit. So I'm a I'm a history major, actually. Oh, from Princeton, huh? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. There are some good professors there. There are some good professors there. There was yeah. one professor named uh, James McPherson, oh, Civil man. War historian. Oh man, that sounds really familiar because I was wrote all... the best book I have ever read called Battle Cry Freedom, and it's the history of the Civil War. Oh, very cool. So I'm reading Grant right now. Have, have you read that? By who? Uh, Chernow, Robert uh, Chernow. I'm a Grant fan, so I don't like that book. Oh. I think I think U.S. Grant's one of the most amazing Americans. I agree. That's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a dense one. Um, yeah. We anyway, have, back we'll have to my we'll, point. Well, we'll have Paralympic to pick up on games. that later, yeah. So there was uh, – a video of a, an athlete who lost both of his legs. He was, uh, he was from Rwanda, and when he was three, he was part of the massacre, and oh. someone came up and chopped his legs off with a machete. Yeah. He is now a jumper, and so he has the cheetah legs. And if you look at where the cheetah legs make him push, they're to the outside. Now, when you oh. watch him run from the side, he looks beautiful. But someone took a drone, which I have done with my son, who is a drone pilot, which is an actual thing, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, well, I believe it. There's probably there's that's probably not a bad career to get into, quite frankly. And they filmed him from the top, 
And now from the side, he looks beautiful. But when you film him from the top, you see the cheetah legs push him out. And what does he do with the, so the cheetah leg pushes his right leg out. He swings that left arm out forward. So the sum of all the movement takes him toward his target. Huh. So and kind of what Cal and I are and messing with is, to that's, yeah, that's right. So you have, your body will work together as one huge piece to get you to your target. Hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. See, it sounds so simple when you explain it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, we chase things. We either run from things or we chase things. And right. if, you, if you want to chase something and kill it, you have to have a stable target. Yeah. Whether yeah. I'm throwing something at you or I'm jumping on you or something like that. Or in my case, my dogs will get you first and I'm going to finish it up. Uh, <laughs> I got to have a target. We have to have a target. That's what we do is, again, I may get you a lot of shit because I'm going to say we're omnivores who prefer meat. Um, our eyes are in front. We got sharp teeth. You know, right. we're, we're hunters. We're yeah. good at it. Yeah. We're good right. hunters. Absolutely. I'm with you there on that one. Um, well, Chris, man, I, I can't tell you, this is, this has been such a fun conversation. And I feel like next time we'll have to be about uh, U.S. history. For sure. <laughs> I'm actually good at talking about that. Well, I, yeah, I think uh, even if I didn't know that before we started, I think uh, when you started talking about in the middle, I, I would have picked up on it. But, uh, man, I, I know that you've you've put a ton of content out over the years. Um, you know, for people who want to follow along with what you're doing, wh where's the best place for them to find you? Uh, I have a crappy website called Slow Guy Speed School. It hasn't been updated in years. I don't even know the password to it. Um, <laughs> so it's probably not going to change. Okay. Uh, but you can, I, my email is up there. Um, Reflexor Performance Reset is our RPR stuff. I publish all of my articles on Track Football Consortium. Uh, with Tony Holler and on Instagram and Twitter, it's TFC I, something. I forgot. It's something along okay, those I'll, lines. Just I'll track it, it down. I'll track it but down and Tony, put all that in the show notes. Tony and I are doing something I think is really cool because normally twice a year, actually it's been more where we host TFCs in different cities. It's usually we always have one in Chicago so I can take people out to all the good restaurants because we are the king of restaurants here in Chicago. Yeah. You guys are pretty um, good at pizza as well. Yeah, well, once you get past the pizza thing, that's when we can get into the real good food. Oh, we know really? we have okay. good pizza here. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> that's a given. And so we bring in outside of the box thinkers to come give presentations, uh, to share what they do. Cal always comes and speaks. Dan Fichter always speaks. We've had Carl Lewis. We've had all kinds of people come and speak. Oh, and we amazing. sell, we record all those videos and we sell them. We sell them online. Uh, so any presentation I've given, uh, Peter Way and Ken Clark, all these guys give presentations and you can buy the presentations for 15 bucks, oh, which awesome. is more than fair. Yeah. Um, so That's what great. Tony and I are do doing this year because of COVID, we're doing 20 coaches and 20 nights. And so we're going to get the 20 best people that we have seen to do uh, a webinar, an hour webinar and whatever they're passionate about, because we always ask that we want you to speak on what you're passionate about. Yeah. Uh, that, I think that's really important. Um, and then uh, you buy the package and then one night for the entire month of December, all the way up until Christmas, uh, that coach will come on and do a Zoom with everyone. You can ask some questions about the presentation, ask some questions about whatever. Very so we've got people from New Zealand. We've got people coming from South Africa. We've got people coming from all over the world, the best people we can find for 20 nights, 20 coaches for our TFC because we don't know what's going to happen when we can meet again, yeah. all that stuff. But we want to get this information out. Um, I'm doing some really cool stuff with Ken Clark and Cal right now. Ken Clark came out with some awesome research about sprinting. And we're building a whole program around what Ken found. Um, go to a, Ken Clark Speed. He's a researcher that worked with Peter Wayand. Is he at Westchester? He is at Westchester. I, okay. So I was, people might be surprised to learn. I do a little bit of preparation before these things. <laughs> uh, and I was, I was watching a, a video of his that you tweeted out. And actually Westchester, I don't think is too far from where I'm at. So where are you? Uh, I am in Eastern Pennsylvania, Bucks County. That's new. That's not too far from you. Yeah. Yeah. He does good stuff. He's brilliant. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll I wrote a research paper with him on overspeed training. Um, oh, cool. 
And I've got another one coming out about wearables that he and I did together with Aaron Fester that hasn't been published yet. Uh, mm. COVID kind of wrecked all the research paths. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about 20 nights, 20 coaches. Um, yeah, that sounds amazing. And when, and and when, when, we, when is that? I'm going to link to it, but it's coming up soon. Uh, it's going to be, excuse me, open for sale. I think October 3rd, we're going to put it out there. And then okay. I think you can download the packages probably Thanksgiving weekend. So you can have something to do since you probably can't get together with people or go Black Friday shopping or anything like right. that. Um, and then we'll open up the Zooms in December. Um, Very and cool. And again, Cal is going to do Cal, me and Ken and Dan Fichter are all going to be based on this new research on sprint training, which is really good stuff. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely going to link to all that. Uh, and Chris, man, I, I, I can't tell you. Thank you again. This is, this has been an absolute blast. No problem. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to have you back. Fun. We'll have to have you back in the future for sure. L love to come back. All right.